if you've never seen Rebels or it's been a while and you need a recap, you've come to the right place. I'm going to give you everything you need to know to prepare for the Ahsoka series. Obviously, be prepared for some spoilers ahead. Also, some of the events and characters I'm going to cover in this video, I've made more in-depth videos about. So if you stay tuned to the end, I'll give you a playlist of a few videos that dig deeper into some of these things I cover here. Okay, let's start where we are at in the timeline. The start of the Rebel story takes place around four years before the events of Episode 4, A New Hope, and the destruction of the first Death Star over the planet Yavin. Officially, it's the year 4 BBY, or four years before the Battle of of Yavin. At this point, the rebellion is still in its infancy with just a few small pockets of resistance. One of those pockets is an outer rim planet on Lothal. It's here that we're introduced to our colorful band of rebels known as the Spectres. They're also known as the Ghost Crew, which is named after their ship, the Ghost. Now, the leader of the Spectres is a Twi'lek named Hera Syndulla from the planet Ryloth. Her father, Cham Syndulla, is a fierce warrior and rebel leader who actually almost killed Darth Vader and Emperor Palpatine about eight years earlier. Needless to say, Hera has been fighting wars since she was a small child. Her counterpart, her partner in love interest, is Kanan Jarrus. Now, Kanan's actual real name is Caleb Dune, and he was a Jedi Padawan under the Jedi Master Depa Balaba when Order 66 was carried out. She was killed by her clones right in front of Caleb, but he was able to escape. He then went into hiding and later changed his name to Kanan Jarrus. Next, we have Sabine Wren, a colorful Mandalorian warrior and, as we can see from her armor, an artist. She's from Clan Wren, which is a vassal of House Vizsla. We'll get more into Sabine's backstory and family later in the video. Next, Gerazeb Aurelios, or just Zeb for short. He's a Lasat warrior from the planet Lasan. His whole planet was all but destroyed by the Empire and is one of the few surviving Lasat left. Finally, we have have Chopper, a C-1 astromech droid. He was serving the Republic during the Clone Wars when his ship was shot down during the Ryloth campaign. He was pulled from the wreckage by Hera and restored. They've been pretty much inseparable ever since. The Spectres were on a mission on Lothal to steal some weapons from the Empire, then sell them later for food and fuel. It's on this mission that their plan is hijacked by a local kid named Ezra Bridger. Quickly, Kanan senses that he has some force ability and eventually they bring him into the Spectre group. Now, both the Spectres and Ezra are a bit reluctant to trust each other at first, but they do slowly build the bond and begin to see that they can do a lot of good together. Kanan even starts to train Ezra as an apprentice. Now they carry out several missions for a mysterious cloaked figure with a code name Fulcrum. During one mission in particular, one that involves rescuing some Wookiee slaves, Kanan reveals himself to be a Jedi to the Empire. Now this gains the attention of somebody called the Grand Inquisitor. The Inquisitors were a small group of Force sensitives formed by the Emperor Palpatine to hunt down any remaining Jedi that survived Order 6. Kanan and Ezra escape the Grand Inquisitor several times as he tracks them as they carry out all of these missions. Another Imperial, ISB agent Alexander Callus, is hunting them down on Lothal as well. Both Agent Callus and the Grand Inquisitor are unable to quash this rebellion nuisance on Lothal, so Grand Moff Tarkin shows up in his Star Destroyer to take over. They capture Kanan and bring him aboard Tarkin's Star Destroyer. Here, the Spectres disable Tarkin's ship and rescue Kanan, but not before one last fight with the Grand Inquisitor. Kanan is able to defeat him, exploiting the biggest flaw of these terribly designed lightsabers carried by the Inquisitors. Now, it's time to rendezvous with Senator Bail Organa, who's leading a larger rebel group known as Phoenix Squadron. If you're subscribed to this channel, you are also part of Phoenix Squadron, so welcome rebels. Here we also learn the secret identity of Fulcrum. It's none other than Ahsoka Tano. After Ahsoka escapes Order 66, she goes into hiding under the name Ashla. She hides for about a year before she re-emerges after a quick fight with the Inquisitor where she decides to stop hiding and join the fight against the Empire. At this time, Bail Organa has a somewhat loose spy network that he was trying to manage when Ahsoka offered to spearhead this project under the name Fulcrum. She was the first agent of the program and she was essentially the handler of the ghost crew. Once she revealed herself as Fulcrum to the crew, she became a little more hands-on and even helped them on some missions and started to even help Kanan teach Ezra the ways of the Force. We also discover here that our good friend Captain Rex is still alive. If you haven't seen the Clone Wars, Captain Rex is a main character in the series. He is side by side with both Anakin and Ahsoka throughout 
all of the battles. Anakin and Rex were close, like brothers. And during Order 66, Rex fought off the programming of his inhibitor chip just enough so that Ahsoka could escape. She was actually able to save Rex's life in return by removing his inhibitor chip, which in turn he saves Ahsoka from the other clones. They escape together and go into hiding. And I have a feeling we're going to see Rex in the Ahsoka series. Kanan doesn't trust Rex at first, seeing as Rex is a clone, and it was the clones that turned on the Jedi and killed his master, Depa Balaba. But after some time and a few missions, Kanan starts to trust Rex, and they even become friends. Enter... Darth Vader. Now Ahsoka at this point doesn't know that Anakin is Vader. She senses something when they face the Sith Lord during a dogfight, but she doesn't know quite what she's feeling at the time. Ezra and Kanan face him once and barely escape with their lives. She goes on a mission with the two Jedi back to Lothal where they found the location of an ancient Jedi temple. We see this temple earlier in season 1 where Ezra finds the kyber crystal for his lightsaber. And back at that time Yoda came to them through the force, so they were hoping to find him again, looking for guidance and answers on how to defeat the Sith. Inside the temple, Ezra finds Yoda through the Force who tells him that the answers he seeks are on a Sith planet called Malachor. Kanan finds out the true identity of the Grand Inquisitor that he killed back on Tarkin's ship. He was a Jedi Temple guard during the Clone Wars. And Ahsoka, well, Ahsoka sees a vision of Anakin. A heartbreaking vision. She is dealing with so much guilt. You abandoned me. You failed me. Do you know what I've become? Now, I think we see more of this in the Ahsoka series. Ahsoka still carries guilt of leaving Anakin. She now knows that Anakin becomes Vader. She needs to find peace with that before she can move on, and we're going to get to my theory on that later. A couple of Inquisitors show up as they escape once again, which is an ongoing theme. The Inquisitors show up and the Jedi get away. Now the Inquisitors weren't a huge threat for the most part. They were great at tracking Jedi, but they weren't very powerful in the Force. Not to mention the absolutely terrible design of their lightsabers. Ahsoka fought two of them and pretty much wiped the floor with them without much effort. Now the two Jedi, along with Ahsoka, arrive on Malachor where they find an ancient Sith temple. The Inquisitors show up again and Ezra is separated from Ahsoka and Kanan. As he makes his way back, he finds the former Sith Lord Maul, who was also on the planet searching for something he has been obsessed with for years. So Maul convinces the other three that the secret they're looking for is a holocron on the top of the Sith temple. So they make their way to the top, fighting the Inquisitors as they ascend. Maul sees Ezra as a potential apprentice. So as they get separated, he turns on Kanan and he blinds him with a quick fight. Kanan reaches down deep with the force throwing Maul off the temple. Now at the top, as Ezra finds the holocron, Vader shows up in epic fashion on top of his X-1 advanced TIE fighter. Vader tries to take the holocron from Ezra, and just before Vader lands the killing strike of his lightsaber, Ahsoka calls out to Vader. Now this scene is so heavy. The fight is epic. Anakin and his former Padawan, his little sister, his friend. Now Vader, a Sith Lord, and Ahsoka, who carries so much guilt for leaving Anakin during the Clone Wars, sees finally what Anakin has become. Not this time. Then you will die. Ahsoka! We see at the end, Ahsoka and Vader both barely escape with their lives. We catch a glimpse of Ahsoka heading down into some temple ruins, and as far as the Rebels' timeline goes, this is the last we see of Ahsoka. We will talk about exactly how she survived in a minute, and add some context to this scene and some extremely important events that happened in the last season of Rebels. Now, it's going to be important for the Ahsoka series. So let's now get into about three years before the events of A New Hope. 
Kanan, now completely blind, starts to struggle with his role with Ezra and the Ghost Crew. He spends a lot of time alone. Ezra has taken on a more leadership role in the missions they carry out, but he also grows more angry and resentful towards Kanan. We start to see him touch aspects of the dark side. They eventually reconcile and get back on track. They rescue Wedge Antilles from the Sky Strike Academy and bring him into the Rebellion, in which we all know he flies later on alongside Luke in the famous trench run to destroy the first Death Star. But all these rebel shenanigans really start to be taken seriously by the Empire, so they bring in someone to deal with them. Here we get our very first glimpse of Grand Admiral Thrawn. Now Lothal is extremely important to Thrawn. He opens up a factory to build a new type of TIE fighter that would probably destroy just about any starfighter in the entire galaxy. They were faster, more heavily armed, and capable of hyperspace travel. Unfortunately, he was competing with director Orson Krennic for funding for his TIE fighter defender program. See, Orson Krennic was in charge of a program called Stardust, which we know now as the secret code for the Death Star construction. Now Thrawn loses out on the funding after the Rebels steal the TIE Defender prototype and eventually blow up the factory, and we'll get to that in a second. During the same time, Sabine, Ezra, and Kanan go to Dathomir, Maul's home planet, and they find the Darksaber in Maul's lair. Now, I cover this in another video in depth, but Sabine reluctantly trains with the Darksaber for a while under the guidance of Ezra and Kanan. She becomes pretty proficient, and so her lightsaber skills, combined with her Mandalorian weapons designed to fight Jedi, will definitely come in handy in the Ahsoka series when we see her in the trailers fighting Shin Hati. Meanwhile, Ezra is lured to Tatooine by Maul, who is obsessed with finding Kenobi. That was his whole purpose for being in that Sith temple on Malachor. He's been looking for Kenobi since his encounter with Kenobi back on Tatooine during the Phantom Menace. Now Ezra finds Kenobi first, or should I say Obi-Wan finds Ezra nearly dead in the desert. Maul follows close behind. Right then, Ezra is sent back home while Obi-Wan and Maul have their final and quite poetic duel. Back at their rebel base, Thrawn has tracked them and the rebels are barely escaped a bombardment from the Imperials. Now this brings us to the final season. This starts us off around a year before we meet Luke Skywalker in A New Hope, about one BBY. Now the Spectres return to Mandalore to help rescue Sabine's father, who's been held captive by the Empire. Now, Sabine had been cast out by her family back when she joined the newly formed Empire. We learn here that they cast her out, but the reason why is pretty crazy. So she helped the Empire design a weapon called the Arc Pulse Generator. This weapon could target Mandalorian Beskar armor and completely disintegrate she was young and naive and wasn't aware that that's what, what they were going to use it for. But the Mandalorians hated her for it. But by this time, when they go to rescue Sabine's father, she had reconciled with her family. They had forgiven her. But with her now wielding the Darksaber, rescuing her father, and freeing her family from being under the thumb of the Empire, she was able to gain the trust and forgiveness of not only her family, Clan Wren, but other Mandalorians as well. This includes Bo-Katan and the Night Owls. Agent Callus, the ISB agent under Thrawn, also defects from the Imperials thanks to Zeb and joins the Phoenix Squadron. He becomes the second Fulcrum agent after Ahsoka Tano. The third agent is actually Cassian Andor. Now the Gross crew return to Lothal where they once again battle Thrawn. Hera is part of an X-Wing squadron attacking the blockade Thrawn has set up on Lothal. Her X-Wing is shot down and she's captured by Thrawn's assassin Rook and taken into custody. Custody. Kanan plans a rescue, and here we're introduced to the Loth Wolves. Now, throughout the series, we've seen these little cute Loth cats, and we see one with Sabine in the Ahsoka trailer, as well as painted on her helmet. But these Loth Wolves are special. They can communicate through the Force. They're semi sentient and have a strong connection to the Force. They keep appearing to Kanan, which is going to become important soon. Kanan starts to understand that he's going to have to do something in order to save Hera. The Wolves continue to appear to him and communicate with him through the the force. Sabine, Kanan, and Ezra set off to rescue Hera, and the timing is perfect. Thrawn has to leave for Coruscant to meet with the Emperor about getting the funding to his Tide Defender program. Kanan finds Hera as she's being tortured, he frees her, and then they escape to the top of the Lothal fuel depot. Sabine and Ezra find a transport to get back to their base. The Imperials send some Adat walkers to the fuel depot. As Sabine and Ezra make their way to the fuel depot to pick up Kanan and Hera, the walkers are getting closer and closer. Hera tells Kanan something she's been wanting to say for a long time. Just as they're picked up, the walkers do the unthinkable. They fire on the fuel cell that Kanan and Hera are 
standing on. There's no time. Kanan runs over and uses the force to stop the spread of the explosion just long enough to save his friends and the love of his life. It's an absolutely heartbreaking scene. Kanan giving the ultimate sacrifice to save the ones he loves. Of course, this absolutely devastates the ghost crew and Hera more than anyone. Unfortunately, there's no time for mourning. Thrawn is returning to finish off the rebels on Lothal. As they scramble to escape and deal with the loss of Kanan, they run once again into the Loth Wolves. This time, the Loth Wolves carry the crew through a portal and onto the other side of the planet. Almost instantly, this portal is a special place. This place can only be accessed through the Force and the Loth Wolves possess the ability to travel into and through it. Now, at the same time, the Empire found the Jedi Temple on Lothal, where below it, a painting served as a puzzle, a gateway to this special place, but they're unable to solve this puzzle or figure out how to enter. Now Ezra here is given the key to this portal by the Loth Wolves and he's able to get into this mystical world. Now the official name of this world is a place called the World Between Worlds. This World Between Worlds is a realm that connects all of time and space. Now this is going to be important in the Ahsoka series, but this place has doorways that tie together time and space. Here, Ezra makes his way around to different doors, seeing things from both the past, the present, and the future. Above one portal in particular, he sees the Morai. This is the bird that has close ties with Ahsoka, something I go over in my big Ahsoka video. He looks through the portal that the Morai is sitting above, and he sees Ahsoka fighting Vader back on Malachor during season two. Now, just as Vader is going to strike her down, Ezra reflexively reaches in, grabs Ahsoka, and pulls her into safety as the temple collapses. Ezra realizes that if he could save Ahsoka, that he could even save Kanan, who sacrificed his life to save Ezra, Hera, and Sabine. Now Ahsoka warns him though that trying to go back and change the past would be catastrophic. Kanan sacrificed himself to save the others, so going back and trying to save Kanan in the world between worlds would cause the rest of the Spectres to die in his place. So here the Emperor finds them and they have to escape. Ezra runs and escapes back into the Lothal portal while Ahsoka escapes back through the door to Mount Malachor. Ezra seals the door to the world between worlds and collapses the temple. Next, the rebels capture Governor Price, who's a real piece of work, and they take the Imperial Dome. Just then, Thrawn and the Seventh Fleet shows up. Thrawn's bodyguard and assassin, the Nogri named Rook, disarms Lothal's shield generator as Thrawn starts to bombard the city. Ezra surrenders and agrees to board Thrawn's destroyer, the Chimera. The deal was that if Ezra surrenders, Thrawn would stop bombarding the city. So just before he leaves, he gives his lightsaber to Chopper, which is why we see Sabine in the Ahsoka trailer has Ezra's lightsaber. Now, the one thing I haven't mentioned is Ezra's ability to understand and communicate with animals, but there's one animal in particular that Ezra has a strong bond with. It's an animal called the Pergil. They're essentially space whales. He helps them out on a previous mission, and his plan involves them to finally escape Thrawn. As he boards Thrawn's ship, the Pergil enter Lothal and pull the Chimera, the Seventh Fleet, Thrawn and Ezra into unknown space. Whatever happens next happens to both of us. When they glow like that, they're about to jump into hyperspace. Get out of there! I can't do that. The Force will be with you. Always. Now we see the Pergil in the Ahsoka trailer, so they're gonna play a part in Ahsoka and Sabine's search for Ezra in the Ahsoka series. Now this victory on Lothal is the beginning of the end for the Empire. This happens right before the events of Rogue One and then of course, A New Hope. We see Chopper briefly in Rogue One as Captain Syndulla's name is called over the intercom at the Rebel base. Now let's talk about the epilogue and the end of the Rebel series. It starts with Sabine watching Lothal when some X-Wings fly over along with Ahsoka's T6 Jedi shuttle. Now this seems to be a bit of a time jump. She talks about the Emperor's reign coming to an end. Also how Hera and Rex fought in the Battle of Endor and how she was joined by a newcomer, Jason Syndulla, the son of Kanan and Hera. It ends with Ahsoka and Sabine going off to search for Ezra. So now 
what can we expect coming up? Well, I think we'll probably get an explanation on where Ahsoka was during the events of the original trilogy. So between zero and about four AB wire after the Battle of Yavin. Hera is a general in the New Republic. Mon Mothma is elected chancellor. And we actually saw Zeb in season three of The Mandalorian at a fighter pilot bar. And we know by this time, Luke and Ahsoka have met. We saw them in the Book of Boba Fett while Luke was training Grogu. So hopefully we can see them meet for the first time and and honestly, I would love to see them talk about Anakin. Really, I could watch an entire episode of just them sitting down and talking about what happened to Anakin. Now Thrawn is also returning. We have some new dark Jedi and the search for Ezra continues. Sabine Wren is a colorful Mandalorian, a trusted member of the Spectre's Rebel Cell, and a fan favorite in the Rebel series. But why did the other Mandalorian clans absolutely despise Sabine? Her much darker past starts when she joins the new Imperial Academy on Mandalore just after the formation of the Galactic Empire. She was a very young and idealistic cadet who believed in what the Empire stood for. Her clan, Clan Wren, was part of House Vizsla who aligned with the Empire after the Clone Wars. She was so idealistic and trusting in her patriotism that they were able to convince her to help build something called the Arc Pulse Generator. This super weapon would target specific metals used in armor, superheating it and then disintegrating the person wearing it. It could even target Beskar. Now I don't know why she believed that this thing would be used for anything other than destruction, but apparently she believed that this would be used more as a deterrent and peacekeeping rather than a weapon. So she nicknamed it the Duchess after Duchess Satine Kreese of Mandalore. And in a shock to absolutely nobody but Sabine, the Empire of course used it to control and oppress the people of Mandalore. Now, full of both guilt and anger towards the Empire for using the weapon against her own people, Sabine defected from the Imperials and spoke out against their tyranny. But the damage was already done. The Mandalorians saw the Arc Pulse Generator as an abomination and branded Sabine as a traitor for creating something that would destroy her own people. Beskar armor was sacred to the Mandalorians and was passed down from generation to generation. And her family, Clan Wren, who were located on Cronest, saw her defection from the Empire as additionally traitorous, banning her from their clan. The Empire didn't take too kindly, of course, to her escaping, so as punishment, Mandalore Viceroy Gar Saxon, also part of House Vizsla, took Sabine's father hostage and sent him to a remote prison facility on Mandalore. Her brother Tristan was then forced to serve in the Imperial Super Commando Squad under Gar Saxon. Before Sabine's escape, she destroyed the super weapon, but unfortunately they were able to use her research to build another one. She became a bounty hunter with Ketsuonyo before joining Hera and the Spectres and starting her steep path to redemption. As a member of the Spectres, she quickly found herself on Lothal's most wanted list for wreaking havoc on the Imperial base. But her more notable redemption acts included rescuing a young Wedge Antilles from the Sky Strike Academy and recruiting him to join the Rebellion. She then gained the respect and allegiance of Fen Rao, the leader of the Mandalorian protectors of Concord Dawn, and also stealing a prototype TIE Defender Elite from the Imperial Factory on Lothal. She eventually found the Darksaber in a Night Sister Lair on Dathomir, which is a symbol of leadership of both House Vizsla and Mandalore itself. She took it to Cronest, where she reunited with her family, defeating Gar Saxon in a duel. Saxon was then killed by Sabine's mother, Ursa, in an act of reconciliation. She rescued her father on Mandalore with the help of Bo-Katan and the Night Owls, but learned of a new arc pulse generator that the Empire had recreated. Bo-Katan and her group were furious that Sabine would create such a weapon that turned their armor against them. So Sabine set out to destroy the machine and the blueprints once and for all. The crew found the arc pulse generator and Sabine reprogrammed it to target stormtrooper armor this time, so that when they did detonate it, all the Imperial stormtroopers would be destroyed. Now, with the blueprints erased, Sabine uses the Darksaber to slash the core of the super weapon, destroying it forever. She then gives the Darksaber to Bo-Katan, where the other clans meet and unite in support of their new leader. Although she committed some unspeakable acts against her people, albeit unknowingly, with both her family and the Mandalorian people turning their backs against her, Sabine was able to redeem herself and unite the clans, which I think is pretty impressive.
What do Balin Skull and Shin Hati have to do with the world between worlds? Is there a connection with them and the Loth Wolves? Why could their presence be so important in the Ahsoka series? It's time we take a deep dive into my theory on these two interesting new villains. First, let's start with the world between worlds. Now this is a mystic realm that connects the different points in time and space in the Star Wars universe. This realm served as a collection of doors and pathways existing between time and space, creating a conduit between the living and the dead. You could access this realm through a portal in the hidden Jedi temple on Lothal. In the temple, there was a painting of the Mortis gods, the father, the son, and the daughter. This painting was the key to revealing the entryway to the realm, and a force wielder would need to use the keystone from the temple, place it in the hand of the daughter in order to open the gates to the realm. Now, you're probably wondering at this point how Loth Wolves even play into this. Well, Loth Wolves have a strong connection to the force and served as guardians of the light side. These wolf giants were thought to be extinct until about 1 BBY when they were revealed themselves to Ezra. These wolves are sentient and could speak through the force with visions and telepathy. They were capable of moving through hyperspace and the world between worlds. Now to Balin Skull and Shin Hati, our new villains. Dave naming them Skull and Hati was not random. In Norse mythology, Skull and Hati are both wolf giants who are sent out by Odin to chase the sun and the moon. During Ragnarok, the end of the world of gods and men, Skull and Hati would finally catch the sun and the moon and plunge the world into darkness. This begins Ragnarok. Here's somewhat of a loose connection to the Norse mythology and Ahsoka. The ancient Jedi planet Tython has two moons. One was the light side moon called Ashla. Now, if you guys remember, those of you who watched uh, Tales of the Jedi and also read the Ahsoka novel, Ahsoka used the name Ashla after escaping Order 66 and went into hiding. Now, I know this is somewhat of a stretch, but the fact that Skull and Hadi chased the moon and Ahsoka's secret name was Ashla, the light side of the moon on Tython, is something I found pretty peculiar and I just, I thought I at least had to point out that little nugget. All right, so back to some likely scenarios for their role in the Ahsoka series. One, it seems to be confirmed that Balin is a survivor of Order 66 who escapes into the unknown regions. We also saw what looks like him and Ahsoka fighting in the world between worlds during the trailer. And also in a few interviews, Ray Stevenson mentions a few things that gives us clues as to what purpose he serves. In your perspective, who is Balin? Uh, um, Balin has a mission. Balin has a quest. And basically, if you're in his way, he'll, he'll respectfully ask you to get out out of it. If you don't, you will be swept aside because there's something far greater than him. And in the Star Wars world, imagine him like a catalyst you throw in to two elements and all of a sudden there's a reaction. So that catalyst threads and you go like, well, who, who is it? What, what is he? Even I don't know fully yet, right? But it's, there's a, vo there's a voyage of discovery. With this, with this character and Shin. So Balin and Shin, they have a quest. Are they trying to go back and change what's happened in the past? Is there a connection to them and the Loth Wolves? Are they Loth Wolves and not actually villains at all? I'm just thinking out loud here, but one thing Ray mentioned was that nothing is what it seems. You don't know if he's a bad guy or a good guy, but one thing is for sure is nobody better get in his way. As we saw in Rebels, Ahsoka tells Ezra that changing the past in the world between worlds would alter the future and that him, Sabine, Zeb, and Hera would all be dead if he was to try and rescue Kanan. So Ahsoka may be trying to stop Balin and Shin from going back to Order 66 and all in the past because doing so would start Ragnarok or the end of the world or some catastrophic event in the Star Wars galaxy. Now at a fan expo panel, Dave Filoni compared the Loth Wolves to the Bendu. Not good or evil, somewhere in the middle, which could also be a clue to the unique orange color of their lightsabers. It's not quite red like the Sith, and not quite any other color that the Jedi would use either. Now Dave doesn't just include the wolves because he likes them. He does, but he also understands their cultural perception of the wolves as guides and that Loth wolves in particular are a natural element to the force on Lothal. Now Balin Skull and Shin Hadi are clearly important to this story. Their names, the color of their lightsabers, the Loth Wolves, Order 66, and the world between worlds are all connected in the Ahsoka series. 
How exactly? I don't know for sure, but clearly this is going to be a big part of the plot. And I think them trying to go back in time to stop Order 66 is a pretty interesting idea and one that would put Ahsoka on the opposite side of their quest. And we also got to throw in their Grand Admiral Thrawn in the mix. Shin seems to be wielding Kanan's lightsaber, which was given to Thrawn during the Battle of Lothal after Kanan died saving his friends. With the introduction of the Inquisitors back in the old Legends books, then brought into canon in Rebels, we now have them in live action in the Obi-Wan Kenobi series. So let's dive into 7 facts you may not have known about these dark side Jedi hunters. Fact number 1. The Inquisitors headquarters was called Fortress Inquisitorius, and it was originally on Coruscant before being moved to the Mustafar system to a moon called Nur. We actually got to see the fortress on Coruscant in the Clone Wars, as Palpatine would meet Count Dooku in secret at this base. The existence of the fortress was moved from Coruscant and hidden on Nur because of an incident involving two rogue Inquisitors and Darth Vader. After these two Inquisitors refused to retrieve the baby of Jedi Master Eeth Koth, Vader chased them on Coruscant, in which a senator was killed in the violent event. Vader, of course, killed the two rogue Inquisitors, but the attention it brought angered Palpatine. In order to maintain a public perception of peace and security, the Emperor relocated their base, now an underwater fortress, on Nur. Fact number two. Before Order 66, Palpatine knew some of the Jedi would escape his grand plan, so he began to lay plans for the inevitable Great Jedi Purge. He hired the bounty hunter Cad Bane to kidnap four sensitive children who would become Jedi younglings in the near future. These children were to become candidates for the future Inquisitor program. We saw this in season two of the Clone Wars, where Cad Bane broke into the Jedi archives and stole a holocron that had locations of four sensitive children. He then captured and tortured and killed Jedi Master Bala Ropal, trying to get him to open the holocron. He then takes Ahsoka prisoner, forcing Anakin to open the holocron, or else he would kill Ahsoka. The bounty hunter then escapes and steals a Force-sensitive Rodian baby. Anakin and Ahsoka rescue the little Rodian on Mustafar, where Palpatine had a secret lab for these children. Mace Windu and Obi-Wan retrieve the holocron after capturing Cad Bane, thwarting his efforts. Fact number three. The Grand Inquisitor is a former Jedi Temple Guard who left the Order after the trial of Barriss Afi. He was inspired by her speech on how the Order had lost its way and that they had become warmongers, acting as military to the Republic rather than its peacekeepers. He saw how the Order treated both Barriss and Ahsoka during the trial, which furthered his disillusionment and made him more susceptible to the dark side. The Grand Inquisitor actually fought Darth Vader inside the Temple Archives room the very first time they met. Vader, of course, easily defeats him. Neither knew who the other one was. And just before Vader kills him, Palpatine enters to reveal that he was the one that orchestrated the meeting between the two. This event is the establishment of the hierarchy. The Grand Inquisitor is to be the first among the Inquisitors, but the Inquisitorius belong to the Sith. They are to answer to Vader, and Vader will instruct and train the Inquisitors as he sees fit. Fact number four. In canon, there is known to be 12 Inquisitors in the Inquisitorious program. Once they are officially accepted, they have their identities stripped from them and instead are given numerical designations along with the title of brother or sister to represent their entry into the organization. Their names are the Grand Inquisitor, the Second Sister, the Third Sister, the Fourth Sister, the Fifth Brother, the Sixth Brother, the Seventh Sister, the Eighth Brother, the Ninth Sister, the Tenth Brother, along with two unidentified Inquisitors, one red-skinned female, and one male Twi'lek. These two unnamed Inquisitors are the ones that Vader chased and killed on Coruscant after their failure to obtain the Force-sensitive baby of Jedi Master Eeth Koth. Fact number five. In training the Inquisitors, Darth Vader tortured, maimed, and abused them. During a training session, he cut off Six Brother's arm. Vader looks at him and says, It's only an arm. 
get up and fight. Six Brother looks down at his arm on the ground, still holding his lightsaber hilt. The Grand Inquisitor, of course, protests, asking Vader what exactly this teaches him. Vader's simple reply is, loss. He also cuts the eye out of the ninth sister and cut off the right hand of the fifth brother. Because they were originally trained as Jedi, all of the Inquisitors, they fought defensively. But Vader's goal was to change their fighting style to be more offensive and brutal. He pushed them to feel pain, to feel loss, and to feel hatred, which in turn makes them much stronger in the dark side of the Force. Fact number six. The Inquisitors, they're not Sith. Emperor Palpatine had Vader train them as assassins and hunters of the Jedi. They were trained to use the dark side of the Force, but to keep within the rule of two, they were not granted the title of Sith Lords or Sith Apprentice. They were not taught the true secrets of the dark side. They were soldiers and killers to be discarded once the Great Jedi Purge was complete. Darth Vader actually despised the Inquisitors. He felt that they were weak and pathetic. He only put up with them because Palpatine had commanded it. By the time the events of Rogue One, all of the Inquisitors had vanished. Fact number seven. The design of their spinning lightsabers or more importantly, their over-reliance on the features of their lightsaber was the biggest weakness in the Inquisitor's fighting style. The basic design is similar to a regular double-bladed lightsaber, similar to Darth Maul's. The biggest issue arises when their half-moon guard flips into a full circle, and then the blade emitter begins to rotate, making their lightsaber spin. The Inquisitor has to hold it out away from his body, creating an obvious weakness that any Jedi would notice. You see it in the fight between the Grand Inquisitor and Vader, that the spinning lightsaber is easily defeated by Vader sticking his saber in the middle of the circular hilt. It happens again to the Grand Inquisitor in Rebels by Kanan and Jarrus. The Inquisitors rely way too much on this feature and it ends up being a major factor in several defeats in battle. Now my personal favorite Inquisitor is the Second Sister, who is a former Padawan named Trilla. For those of you who have played Jedi Fallen Order, you know how powerful she is and how tragic her story was. Now what do you guys think so far of the Inquisitors in live action? Are they formidable or do you share Vader's view that they are weak and insignificant? Thrawn is one of the most compelling characters in all of Star Wars, and what he brings to the Ahsoka series is an antagonist with intentions and motivations that make him so much more than just another villain. I would argue that he could be even seen as an anti-villain, at least from a certain point of view. Luckily, we get that point of view from the new Thrawn canon trilogy written by the creator of Thrawn himself. Timothy Zahn. Now I'm going to cover some of the events of these books, so spoiler warning for those of you who haven't read this new Thrawn trilogy. Now back to the label I've given Thrawn of an anti-villain. Now the definition of an anti-villain is a character with like noble goals, maybe even some heroic traits, but the means to achieve those goals make them the bad guy of the story. Now I think this is definitely the case for Mithron Nerodo. When Timothy Zahn created Thrawn back in the 90s, in the original Heir to the Empire trilogy, the the character had some distinct differences to this character we get to meet in the new Thrawn trilogy and of course in the Rebel series. Throughout all of Star Wars, we're always watching from the perspective of the Rebels or the New Republic. But the beauty of these books is we get to see everything from Thrawn's perspective. Now let's quickly talk about his backstory before we get into one of the most important conversations we get to hear from Thrawn. So we first meet him on an unnamed planet near the Unknown Regions. An Imperial Patrol finds him and he kills some of these Imperials before he gives himself up, where he's finally taken to the Emperor. Now his original story is that he was exiled to this planet by his people, the Chiss Ascendancy. Now here we also get to meet Enzin Eli Vanto. Now I'm going to go more into detail about Enzin Vanto in another video because his role is extremely important to Thrawn. So we get him to the Emperor where he's able to convince Palpatine that he could be an asset to the Empire. What he would do is he's going to advise Palpatine on things of the unknown region in exchange for being able to study the inner workings of the empire. He also warns Palpatine of some pretty grave threats in the unknown regions. One very dangerous threat in particular. One that will become extremely important to Thrawn's story. One that I also think is going to have a big impact in either the Ahsoka series or in Dave Filoni's movie afterwards. Now of course one of the most common facts we know about Thrawn is that he studies his opponents. He studies their art, their history, and their philosophy in order to get a better understanding 
understanding of how they're going to react or make decisions in battle. But there's one conversation that he has that reveals his true motivations, his true reason for joining the Empire. Everything you want to know about Thrawn is revealed in this one conversation. Now, after he went through the ranks of the Imperial Navy Academy, he was tasked with tracking down a rebel leader named Night Swan. Now, this rebel insurgent was extremely smart and had caused quite a problem for the Empire. Thrawn was able to get in communication with him and he actually arranged a meeting in a neutral site. This is where I think the most important conversation happens. What I don't understand is why you still serve the Empire. Can't you see the evil you're helping to perpetuate? I'll give you a scenario. You and I face a dangerous predator intent on slaughter. Running is impossible. Tools and weapons are limited. What are your options? The obvious one is for us to join forces. Unity against the common foe is one choice. But there is another. You strike me down so as to make me the easier prey. While the Predator devours me, you hope to find or build a weapon you can use to assure your own survival. And it was that choice that lay before me when I decided to visit the Empire. Now here Thrawn reveals to Night Swan that he wasn't actually exiled. The Chiss chose him for this specific mission to infiltrate the Empire and to study their inner workings. Thrawn doesn't really view the Empire as the biggest threat or the true evil in the galaxy. So the scenario he just gave Night Swan was exactly what he was facing. He had two choices, either destroy the Empire, collapse it so that this bigger threat would destroy it and give the Chiss more time to prepare or join forces with the Empire in hopes of defeating this larger threat. Now, at the end of this conversation, he even asked Night Swan if he would be willing to join the Chiss Ascendancy to help fight against this true evil. Night Swan, of course, declines it and is killed later on, but it shows that Thrawn doesn't see his enemies as either good or bad, just another problem to solve, and Night Swan would have been better off as an ally rather than being dead. Now, after Thrawn reveals this reason why he joined the Empire, Night Swan asks him why he chooses to serve an Empire that's evil, and Thrawn's response tells you everything you need to know. There are evil things in this galaxy, Night Swan. Far more evil than the Empire, and far more dangerous to all living beings. We know of some, while of others we have heard only rumors. We needed to know whether the Empire that was rising from the ashes of the Clone War could be an ally against them or whether it should instead be collapsed into an easy prey. Thrawn and the Chiss were watching what was going on during the Clone Wars. He saw the Galactic Republic as weak and inefficient. Now, I think that if Palpatine was defeated at the end of the Clone Wars and the Republic was victorious, the Chiss may have went with the second option and collapsed them into an easy prey for this much larger threat. Now, let's get into this much more evil threat to all living beings I've referenced a few times already. This threat we find out in the second book. So once again, here's another spoiler alert for the second book in this Thrawn trilogy. This speech Species, this new threat is called the Grisks. They were a warlike species that lived out in the unknown regions. These are the true evil in the galaxy. They could enslave both the hearts and the minds of entire species. Just a few hundred of them can rule an entire planet. They had the ability to enslave the minds and souls of just about any being. Imagine billions of beings, their hearts and souls broken, ready to fight and to die at the order of just a handful of Grisks. No resistance no revolt, no dissent, and no hope. Not only could the Grisks exploit a species' hopes and fears, they would learn what they kept as their biggest secrets, and they would use these secrets to bring the powerful leaders under their complete control. And Thrawn felt that Palpatine and the Galactic Empire was his best chance at defeating the Grisks. Thrawn wanted Night Swan to join the Chiss because even though he was an enemy, Thrawn respected him enough to know that he could be an asset to the Chiss rather than a waste being killed by him and the Empire. Thrawn also sees the importance and abilities of Eli Vanto and is able to convince Eli to leave the Empire and join the Chiss Ascendancy under Admiral Erelani and her ship called the Steadfast. Now the Grisks had discovered probably the biggest secret of the Chiss and 
And this is where the Empire and the Grisks collide. The Emperor felt a disturbance in the forest near the edge of the unknown regions. So what he did was he sent Thrawn and Vader to investigate and deal with this disturbance. They traveled to a planet called Batu. Now this is a pretty big deal because this is the same planet that Thrawn actually met Anakin Skywalker back during the Clone Wars. Thrawn joined Anakin on a mission to rescue Padme who had gone missing. And this is where the brilliance of Palpatine shows. Anakin had told Palpatine back during the Clone Wars when he was a Chancellor about this mission to Batu to save Padme as well as meeting and working with Thrawn. So what Palpatine is doing here is he's testing both Vader and Thrawn. Vader having to confront his past going back to Batu and Mokivja where he went to rescue Padme while Thrawn having to confront his future. See Palpatine was constantly questioning and challenging Thrawn's true allegiance whether it was to the Empire or to the Chiss. What Thrawn and Vader discover out in the unknown regions is what Thrawn feared the most. The Grisks had discovered the biggest secret that the Chiss Ascendancy regarded the most. In the unknown regions, hyperspace lanes were unstable. They were nearly impossible to navigate. Now there weren't any nav computers that were capable of plotting maps through them. Now the Chiss secret was that they used force sensitive Chiss girls to navigate hyperspace. This way it was nearly impossible to find the Chiss homeworlds without these navigators. Now the Chiss referred to these girls and their powers and the, their force abilities called third sight. Uh, you can also think of it as like precognition. This is why they were able to navigate the unknown region so easily. The Grisks, they discovered this secret and they had actually kidnapped these Chiss girls in order to be able to reach the Chiss homeworlds. This was the disturbance in the forest that the Emperor felt. Vader and Thrawn were able to defeat the Grisks and rescue the girls. Thrawn wanted to chase them out into the unknown regions and continue to battle them, but this was the test that Palpatine had laid out for Thrawn, his loyalties. Fortunately, Thrawn was able to convince Vader that this was also a threat to the Empire because the Grisks were actually blocking hyperspace lanes to Batu with their big gravity well generators. So even though Batu was at the edge of unknown regions, they were technically still part of the Empire. Now the Grisks had also been watching the Galactic Republic and the Empire since before the Clone Wars. They were studying them and just seeing how they work. So let's go ahead and tie this into the Rebel series timeline and the Ahsoka series. This mission with Vader happened just after the Battle of Atalon against the Spectre. We know why Thrawn is with the Empire. He feels like the rebellion needs to be crushed. The stakes were too high and the real danger to the galaxy was just too great. If the Empire was to fall to the rebels, who would replace it? The inefficient Republic? Squabbling politicians? No, the Empire, according to Thrawn, was the best chance to defeat the Grisks. So after this mission with Vader out to Batu, Thrawn headed out on another mission that was tasked to him by Tarkin and Krennic. Here Thrawn finds out about the Death Star, which of course he confronts Palpatine about. Now Thrawn absolutely despises the Death Star for a few reasons. One, the ability for a weapon that could destroy a planet is a direct threat to the Chiss Ascendancy. The second is he thinks concentrating all of your resources and power into one giant battle station is just not a very good military strategy. Thrawn felt like a large navy full of star destroyers and TIE defenders was a much better way to bring order to the galaxy. Of course, he turned out to be right. During this mission, he once again uses the Empire's resources to fight the Grisks, only this time he joins forces with the Chiss Ascendancy in the Unknown Regions. He actually teams up with Admiral Arulani and of course his former Lieutenant Commander Eli Vanto. In teaming up with the Chiss, he pretty much seals his own death because this absolutely enraged Palpatine. Palpatine always suspected that Thrawn's true allegiance was to the Chiss and he was constantly challenging and threatening. Them. This time, Palpatine felt like Thrawn went too far. The Emperor had one last mission to Lothal to deal with these rebels and he was to return to Coruscant to meet with him for a very long talk about this betrayal. Well, as we know from the Rebel series, Forgen would smile down on this Chiss warrior. Ezra Bridger would call on the Pergil to drag Thrawn and the Seventh Fleet into unknown space. This essentially saves Thrawn's life. This is the genius of Thrawn. I think he knew the Emperor was going to kill him when he got back, especially after potentially failing on Lothal on top of his betrayal in the previous mission. Now one thing we do know is that nobody has ever beaten Thrawn with strategy of any kind. He was always able to figure out what the plan was. I think, and this is a, just a theory of mine, that Thrawn was aware, at least in a general sense, of what Ezra was planning to do, at least in the very last moments. I think he intentionally didn't try and stop Ezra. If he was dragged into hyperspace and into uh, the unknown regions by the Pergils, he would escape essentially the 
wrath of the emperor. Now, of course, this is just my theory, but this finally brings us to the Ahsoka series. Thrawn has survived. He's outlived the emperor. Of course, we have some questions on where exactly he's been, but now with the Imperial remnant in disarray, he has the opportunity to rule and lead them against what he thinks is the true enemy. Now, I'm excited for one to see how things have gone since the Rebels finale. I'm wondering how the Grisks are going to play into the series or in Filoni's movie to follow. Maybe Thrawn is convinced Ezra of the real threat to the galaxy and it's not the Imperial Remnant. What would be interesting is if they're looking for a way to transition maybe into the First Order. Maybe there's a big war with the Grisks and Thrawn and the Imperial Remnant, the Chiss Ascendancy, Ahsoka, the Mandalorians, Luke, Leia, Han, and from the ashes of this huge war could rise the First Order. Maybe. Now Thrawn's main mission has always been the protection of his people. That has always come first. Throughout the entire trilogy, one thing that continually pops up from Thrawn is the mission always comes first. This is what makes Thrawn such a compelling antagonist in the Ahsoka series. We may finally get to see the best military strategist in the Galactic Empire in live action in the upcoming Ahsoka series. So let's dive into Thrawn's three favorite battle tactics that are absolutely brilliant. The first tactic was introduced in the Legends Thrawn trilogy book, Heir to the Empire. Dave Filoni liked it so much that he brought it into canon during the Clone Wars. It's called the Marg Sable. It's named after a Togruta flower that would open up in all directions like a sunburst every morning. During the Clone Wars, the Separatists were blockading the planet Ryloth when Ahsoka came up with a plan that would break the blockade, allowing the Republic forces to land on the ground. Anakin flew his Venator ship into the Separatist blockade ship, escaping in a pod just before impact, while Ahsoka had Colonel Yularen take his Venator and turn the battleship so that the hangar bay was facing away from the enemy ships. Then, the Starfighters were released released from the hangar bay and got up to attack speed and into formations while still in the visual shadows of the Venator. By the time the enemy seized the starfighters, it was too late. They were outflanked from both sides and destroyed. Now how did Thrawn learn this? Towards the end of the Clone Wars, he was helping Anakin Skywalker track down Padme who had gone missing on Mokivja. Anakin told Thrawn during a fight with some battle droids that he would be a one-man Mark Sable going into the fight. Thrawn asked Padme what that meant. Padme explained that Ahsoka Tano, Anakin's former Padawan, developed the Mark Sable technique to defeat a droid blockade. Thrawn really liked the idea and he used it on a mission for the Empire in the Unknown Regions when he was fighting the Grisks. His next maneuver is called the Slingshot. This move is brilliant and it was used in very specific situations. One of Thrawn's unique strategies was studying his opponent's artwork their culture, and philosophies. He made sure he knew his enemy extremely well. If he knew an opponent relied on sensor readouts and signals in battle, he would employ the slingshot. All ships use thrusters that put off heat and propulsion signatures that are picked up on scanners and radar that give away their location. So what Thrawn would do is drop starfighters from the bottom hangar bay of the Chimera, completely unpowered other than minimal communications and scanners. The fighters would float down until they were grabbed by the capital ship's tractor beams and brought towards the front of the nose. As the starship gained momentum, the tractor beams would be cut and the nose of the Chimera would move out of the way, slingshotting the starships out towards the enemy ships. This worked perfectly when Thrawn discovered that another Grand Admiral had been stealing from the Empire. This particular Grand Admiral, Thrawn knew, relied heavily on his instruments, his scanners, and his sensors. So he was completely unaware of the TIE fighters Thrawn had slingshot around his ship and were then able to destroy the Grand Admiral's laser and ion cannons. The final strategy he used was specific to an enemy that used gravity well generators. It was called the pincer. Thrawn became a master of what's called micro jumps. These were precision hyperspace jumps over a short distance. A pilot could launch into hyperspace and then quickly pulled out by a planet's gravity. The gravity well generators used by the Grisks were an artificial form of this. Thrawn would split his fleet in half and attack an enemy head on with one half. With the other half, he would jump to a nearby star system. When the Grisks would activate their gravity well generators, the second half of the fleet would launch into hyperspace and let the gravity well generators pull them out so they would end up behind or flanking the enemy ship. Ordinarily, you couldn't be so accurate when you dropped out of hyperspace. You would just travel at sublight speeds until you reached a predetermined destination. These micro jumps to outflank an enemy caught them with their pants down every single time. Thrawn would also use the TIE defenders to accomplish this micro jump as they were one of the only TIEs that had a hyperdrive. A 
Ahsoka is one of the most important characters in all of Star Wars. She is a vital part of the connective fiber that makes up who Anakin Skywalker is, how the Rebellion was able to succeed in defeating the Empire, and now in the Ahsoka series, the key to fighting Grand Admiral Thrawn and the greater threats to the galaxy. Here is everything you need to know about Ahsoka Tano before you watch the Ahsoka series. Ahsoka is Jedi. First, let's break down her backstory and why she's so important to Star Wars. Now, during the beginning of the Clone Wars, just after the events of Episode 2, Attack of the Clones, Anakin Skywalker was assigned to Padawan right in the middle of the Battle of Christophsis. A little Togruta named Ahsoka Tano. Of course, this was a bit of a shock to Anakin and he felt that it must have been a mistake. There's been a mix-up. The youngling isn't with me. Stop calling me that. You're stuck with me, Sky Guy. What did you just call me? <laughs> Don't get snippy with me, little one. You know, this arrogant, overconfident, feisty little Padawan immediately challenged Anakin's patience, but pretty quickly he recognized a lot of himself in her disobedience, brashness, and rebellious nature. You never would have made it as Obi-Wan's Padawan. But you might make it as mine. The beginning of her apprenticeship was rough. Her overconfidence and arrogance backfired in a major way as she was given command of a mission, and her ignoring orders gets her entire squadron of clone troopers killed in battle. But this early failure really helps her grow and understand how she has a responsibility to keep her soldiers safe, and this plays a vital role in her growth as a character as a whole. Ahsoka and Anakin's relationship continues to grow as they fight together along with Commander Rex and the 501st. They develop a brother-sister bond that is extremely important to both Anakin and Ahsoka's growth. We get to see Anakin's loyalty to the ones he cares about, much deeper than we get to see in any of the movies. I too care for my apprentice, but if their time has come... I refuse to let Ahsoka die. She will find a way out. We see how him and Ahsoka both question the rules and the philosophies of the Jedi Order. They fiercely protect each other. Both George Lucas and Dave Filoni show the contrast between the bond of Anakin and Ahsoka and any of the other Jedi and their own Padawans. Now nothing shows this better than in the Mortis arc. Obi-Wan, Anakin, and Ahsoka make their way into Mortis, an ethereal realm that exists outside of any star system, a place that some believe was the birthplace of the Force. Entrance to this realm was never voluntary, as it drew in its visitors inexplicably. Time has no meaning on Mortis, so days or weeks in the realm passed in just seconds in the real world. Now, Mortis was inhabited by three beings. The son, who embodies the dark side of the force, the daughter, who embodies the light side, and the father, who keeps them in balance because they are in a constant battle. They bring the three Jedi there specifically because of Anakin, the chosen one. What they wanted was for Anakin to take the place of the father since he was the one prophesied to bring balance to the force. Obi-Wan, Ahsoka, and Anakin all have separate visions while on Mortis. The visions were revelations to each of their own particular futures. Obi-Wan saw his former master Qui-Gon. Ahsoka saw a future version of herself that warned her that if she was to remain the Padawan of Anakin, that her future would be in jeopardy. Anakin saw visions of his dark future and the terrible things that he would do. Now, as they decide to leave Mortis, Ahsoka was taken captive by the sun, who wanted to escape the realm. There was a big battle and the son kills Ahsoka and the daughter. Now because of Anakin's attachment to Ahsoka and the willingness of the daughter as she lay there dying, he was able to transfer the life and essence of the daughter and the light side of the force itself into Ahsoka to save her life. Then let my daughter's last act be to breathe life into your friend. Hey, Snips. Before they finally left Mortis, the father was able to erase Mannequin's memory of the visions he had of his future. Now, I don't think I have to explain how important these events are to both Anakin and Ahsoka and to the Star Wars galaxy as a whole. Now, remember Ahsoka's vision. Be warned. You may never see your future if you remain his student. Leave this planet. 
important because it becomes very important when the Jedi Temple is attacked and bombed by an unknown terrorist. Anakin and Ahsoka are sent to investigate where evidence is revealed that Ahsoka was the one guilty of the crime. Of course she was set up and she was set up by her friend Barriss Afi, the Padawan of Luminara Unduli. But during the investigation she was kicked out of the Jedi Order and imprisoned by the Republic and Governor Tarkin. Anakin of course was the only one who believes her. He fought for her and was the one to finally uncover the truth while Padme was the one defending her at her trial. She was acquitted of the charges and in one of the most emotional scenes in Star Wars, she rejects the offer to come back into the Order. Now this absolutely breaks Anakin's heart as he's losing his sister. The stupidity and the short-sightedness of the Jedi Council with Ahsoka is one of the many dominoes that lead to Anakin and his fall away from the order. As she leaves, Anakin chases her. Here, we see how much alike they are and how close they've become over the years. Why are you doing this? I believed in you. I stood by you. I know you believe in me, Anakin, and I'm grateful for that. But I have to sort this out on my own. Without the Council, and without you. I understand. More than you realize, I understand wanting to walk away from the Order. I know. And just before the end of the Clone Wars, Ahsoka, away from the Jedi Order, is helping some of her friends escape the Pike Syndicate when she runs into Bo-Katan Kryze, whom she knew from fighting her back when she was part of Death Watch. Now they become allies when Bo reveals that Maul has taken over Mandalore. They reach out to the Jedi for help, where she is finally reunited after years with Anakin. Anakin then brings her to see the 501st, where an absolutely beautiful show of respect happens with Rex and the clones. As soon as Rex and the guys knew you were back, they got to work. The paint job's a little crude, but we think it gets the idea across. Now, Bo and Ahsoka are able to convince Obi-Wan to split the 501st into two squads. The newly formed 332nd Company, led by Commander Rex, is to go with Ahsoka and Bo-Katan to Mandalore to capture Maul. This is the last time that Ahsoka sees Anakin, and he gives her a brand new set of lightsabers. Well, they're her old lightsabers, but slightly modified. On Mandalore, they find Maul, who tells Ahsoka about Anakin and the Sith Lord Darth Sidious, his plan to take Anakin as his new apprentice. Ahsoka then fights Maul in one of the best lightsaber fights in all of Star Wars. She's able to finally capture him and hands him over to the Mandalorians. But on the way back to Coruscant, Order 66, the order that begins the entire Jedi Purge is given by Darth Sidious. Rex and the rest of the clone company try to kill Ahsoka, but she's able to escape thanks wholly to Anakin's training where he made her take on the clones over and over. She was able to capture Rex and remove his inhibitor chip which all the clones had as part of their programming to carry out Order 66. She saves his life, and as the other clones are closing in on them, he actually saves Ahsoka's life in return. They're able to escape together as the cruiser crashes down to the surface. Ahsoka then leaves with Rex after another absolutely heartbreaking scene at a memorial of all of the clones who died during the battle. Her and Rex part ways where she leaves her lightsabers behind. Ahsoka escapes to the Outer Rim and goes into hiding under a new name, Ashla. Now Ashla has some significance to her and Star Wars in general. Back in the beginnings of the Jedi, Ashla is referred to as the light side of the Force. And remember the events of Mortis, the sister who embodies the light side transferred her life into Ahsoka so that she could live. And to go even further, back during the beginnings of the Jedi, they lived on a planet called Tython. Now Tython has two moons, a light side moon called Ashla and a dark side moon called Bogan. As she was in hiding, she couldn't hide or run from who she was. She was still a Jedi at heart and her always wanting to help other people is what a Jedi should be at its core. So as she sees the Empire start to tighten its grip and the people and the planet, she of course jumps in to help. Now here she faces an Inquisitor and shows the former Padawan to Anakin Skywalker absolutely destroyed 
destroys this guy. She takes the kyber crystals from the red lightsaber and purifies them, pouring her heart her light, and her will into these red crystals to purify them white. She then reaches out to Bail Organa, who has started to form an intelligence network to fight the Empire. There wasn't any real organization to it, so Ahsoka agrees to join the fight and lead his intelligence network. She calls it Fulcrum. Her role in Fulcrum is to find people that need help against the Empire, working under the disguise as a Fulcrum agent, guiding and assisting rebel cells in their individual fights against the Imperial rule. She reveals herself to the rebel cell, the Spectres, and brings them into the larger Phoenix Squadron rebel fleet. She even helps them track down her old friend Captain Rex, where they have a very heartwarming reunion. She also helps the Jedi Kanan Jarrus and his apprentice Ezra Bidger, all part of the Spectres, as well as the rest of their group, Hera Syndulla, Zeb, Sabine Wren, and of course, my favorite droid, Chopper. Now, on a mission, Ahsoka takes the two Jedi to a Jedi temple on Lothal, where they meet Grandmaster Yoda, who decides to visit them individually through the Force. He tells them that the answer to defeating the Sith is on a planet called Malachor, a planet steeped in the dark side. There, they find a Sith temple, and of course, Maul is waiting for him, who Ahsoka actually set free during her escape of Order 66. It's here that Ahsoka confirms her worst fear, that Anakin is in fact Darth Vader. She fights him on top of the temple in an absolutely brutal and heartbreaking battle as Ezra is able to escape with Kanan. The temple explodes, but we catch a glimpse of her and her Morai walking down into the temple. The Morai, this little owl, acts as her guide and is part of her and the light side of the Force. In all of the paintings of the Mortis gods, the Morai is always with the sister. Once she dies and passes her life force to Ahsoka, the Morai is always around Ahsoka always guiding her. We saw it as Vader finds Ahsoka's lightsaber after Order 66. We see it again as she escapes the fight with Vader. And finally, we see it a few more times later on. Once was a few years later, Ezra finds a place inside the Jedi Temple on Lothal, a mystical realm called the World Between Worlds. This is a mystical realm that connects different points in time and space in the Star Wars universe. This realm serves as a collection of doors and pathways existing between time and space. You could actually Access this realm through this portal in the Hidden Jedi Temple, and inside there was a painting of the Mortis Gods, the father, the son, and the daughter. Now this painting was the key to revealing the entryway to this realm, and a force wielder would need to use a keystone from the temple and place it in the hand of the daughter. Now from this world between worlds, Ezra could see different events that all happened both in the present and in the past through different portals. Above one portal in particular, he sees the Morai sitting on top and calling to him guiding him. He looks through and sees Ahsoka fighting Vader back on Malachor. Just as Vader goes to strike her down, Ezra reflexively reaches in, grabs Ahsoka, and pulls her into safety as the temple collapses. Now Ezra realizes that if he could save Ahsoka, that he could also go back and save Kanan, who sacrificed his life to save Ezra, Hera, and Sabine. Now Ahsoka warns him that trying to go back and change the past would be catastrophic. Kanan sacrificed himself to save the others, so saving Kanan in the world between worlds would cause the rest of the Spectres to die in his place. This is going to be so important in the Ahsoka series, where it looks like we're going to get to see the world between worlds and how it will play a big role in the events to come. Now at the end of the Rebels, there's an epilogue which takes place sometime after the events of Return of the Jedi. Ahsoka and Sabine are off to find Ezra who was pulled into unknown space by the Pergil, a group of space whales he called on with the Force during the battle with Grand Admiral Thrawn. The Pergil, Thrawn, and the Seventh Fleet and Ezra are all pulled away from Lothal and into the unknown regions. Now this finally brings us to the Ahsoka series and where we find ourselves in the timeline. Now what I think is there's going to be some backtracking in time to show what happens after she disappeared after her fight with Vader and her search for Grand Admiral Thrawn in The Mandalorian. We see an Inquisitor in the trailer which makes me think that part of the show will take place during the Rebels era just before the events of A New Hope and the Battle of Endor and of course her search for Thrawn and Ezra. Having an Inquisitor any other time really doesn't make sense, so I'm thinking it really has to take place around the time period of Rebels. This, I think, places the epilogue of Rebels somewhere in the middle of the Ahsoka series, and we'll get to see this story unfold during the timeline of The Mandalorian, around five years after Return of the Jedi, the collapse of the Empire, and of course, the death of Anakin Skywalker. Now, in the Ahsoka trailer, we find out that Thrawn survives, and we have two brand new force-wielding villains 
villains, Balin Skull and Shin Hati. I believe it's been confirmed that Balin is a survivor of Order 66 who escaped into the unknown regions. Shin is his apprentice. Now at the end of this video, I have a crazy theory of their roles in the show, a video that I've made, so make sure to stay tuned at the end and I'm going to link to that video. We also, at the very end of the trailer, get to see Hu Yang. He's the droid who was extremely important to the Jedi Order. For a thousand generations, he taught Jedi younglings, including Grandmaster Yoda, how to construct their lightsabers. This droid will be extremely important in rebuilding the Jedi Order. So maybe, just maybe, we could see Ahsoka reunite with Hu Yang and possibly find Luke Skywalker, who at this time is trying to rebuild the Jedi Order. We know during the events of the Book of Boba Fett that Ahsoka and Luke were together for a time while he was attempting to train Grogu on Ossus. In the sixth episode of Tales of the Jedi, Ahsoka was referred to as Ashla by her friend. Now this is a fantastic callback to A New Hope. See, George Lucas originally referred to the light side of the Force as Ashla, and the dark side of the Force was referred to as Bogan. But this never made it into the final cuts of the trilogy. However, it was brought into canon by Dave Filoni in Rebels, when the Bendu referred to the light side of the Force as Ashla. Also in Legends, the Jedi planet Tython, there were two moons, a light moon called Ashla, and a dark moon called Bogan. Ahsoka Tano died. What? But she was given a gift to the power of the Force that no other Jedi has. To understand this, we have to start where she was born, on the planet Shili. A Zygerian slaver shows up after hearing about a little force sensitive to Gru to girl. This Zygerian pretended to be a Jedi and offered to take little Ahsoka to the Jedi Temple on Coruscant to train her. Her village celebrated and rejoiced. Being a part of the highly regarded Jedi Order was something that Togruta held very dearly, as it was extremely rare for them to even see a Jedi, let alone to have one of their people actually become one. Ahsoka, even in her young age and being untrained, sensed something was wrong and that this Zygerian was no Jedi. She ran and hid from the slaver and reached out through the force to find anyone out there who could possibly help. We saw Grogu use this same power in the Mandalorian on the planet Tython. Through the will of the force, it was Jedi Master Plo Koon that heard her call. Now, Ahsoka had a very difficult and potentially life-threatening decision to make. Trust this scary looking stranger or to run away again. She sensed both his power and the light in the force and chose to trust him. The will of the force once again manifesting itself through the will wisdom of Master Yoda led Ahsoka to become the Padawan of Anakin Skywalker, a reckless but passionate Jedi Knight. Ahsoka and Anakin started off a bit rough. You're stuck with me, Sky Guy. Did you just call me? <laughs> don't get snippy with me, little one. You know, I don't even think you're old enough to be a Padawan. But they grew to mirror each other in so many ways. You never would have made it as Obi-Wan's Padawan, but you might make it as mine. They were both compassionate and shared a deep connection to the Force. They put the lives and the safety of others first and always helped anyone in need. They protected and cared for each other deeply and both questioned the Jedi philosophies of attachment and caring for others. But here is what changed Ahsoka's path forever. The Jedi received the transmission from beyond the Outer Rim with an ancient Jedi code that hadn't been used in over 2,000 years. Anakin, Obi-Wan, and Ahsoka were sent to investigate. On their way to the Trilithium system, their ship was pulled into a realm called Mortis. Here, they met three beings. They were force wielders, beings that embodied the force and were forever locked in a battle of dominance over each other. The son, who represented the destructive and deadly aspects of the dark side, the daughter, who represents the peace and creation of the light side, and the father to maintain the balance between the two. Here, Ahsoka has a vision of her future self through the Force. She's warned that she's in danger, that she may never see her future if she is to remain Anakin Skywalker's student. Now, we're going to dig a little bit deeper into this in a moment because this is a big revelation, and it ties in with a big decision that she makes later on. As the three Jedi try to leave the planet, 
the son grabs Ahsoka from the ship and takes her back to the planet. His goal is to convince Anakin to turn to the dark side. And if Anakin won't join him, then the son would kill Ahsoka. As the son and daughter battle, the son kills Ahsoka and then stabs the daughter with his blade. Now at this point, the father realizes that there is no light within the force. If the daughter dies, only darkness. The last act as the daughter dies is to have the father transfer her essence, breathing life back into Ahsoka. With that, the light side of the force is restored. Now this changes the path and the purpose of Ahsoka forever. She is now the embodiment of the light side of the force. She was dead, but with the will of the force chose her to live and to continue her deeper purpose. Now back to the Ahsoka's vision, her future self tells her that she may never see her future if she's to remain Anakin's student. This ties directly in with her surviving Order 66. She is framed for bombing the Jedi Temple by Barriss Afi, and the Council removes her from the order completely. Of course, she's innocent, and once her name is cleared, she's asked to return, but she declines. She leaves the order and is no longer the Padawan of Anakin Skywalker, devastating everyone especially Anakin. This ties directly with her vision. Had she stayed in the Order, she would have died during Order 66. That's how at least I interpret the events. With her leaving, she has Rex with her when Order 66 is ordered. She saves Rex and is able to escape with his help. This was her true path away from the Jedi Order. She saw what Anakin saw. Even Barriss Offee knew. The Jedi had lost their way. They had become the military arm of the Republic not peacekeepers. She was strong enough to leave the order while Anakin, feeling the same exact way she did, could not. Several times she questioned the Jedi's role in the war, their philosophy on things like attachment and emotions, but she embodied everything that a Jedi should be. Selfless, fearless, and always willing to help anyone in need, no matter what. I am no Jedi. You might not think of yourself as a Jedi, but you act like one or at least how I want them to be. Leaving the Jedi Order makes her even more of a Jedi. She sees the hypocrisy of their actions and their abandonment of their own teachings by being in these wars. But what Ahsoka holds so close is the true meaning of what it means to be a Jedi. She is so powerful in her connection to the living force that even when she fights Vader in Rebels before he kills her, a Morai guides Ezra Bridger in the world between world to the doorway where Ahsoka is about to die. He then reaches in and pulls her out, saving her life. Now the Morai is an owl and that's always around Ahsoka. This bird has the spiritual ties to the daughter on Mortis. This is the Morai that is always watching over Ahsoka. Now she is no longer part of the Jedi Order, but that isn't what makes somebody a Jedi. Their connection to the light, their selflessness, their compassion, along with their ability to use the force makes one a Jedi. And nobody embodies that both literally and figuratively more than Ahsoka. If you're curious about how Ahsoka got her lightsabers, click here and may the force be with you. There's a deeper meaning behind each time Ahsoka's lightsabers change colors. From a single green lightsaber, to adding a greenish yellow Shoto saber, then to no lightsabers at all, to her blue lightsabers during the Siege of Mandalore, to finally her white lightsabers in Rebels, The Mandalorian, and now in the Ahsoka series. Obviously, be prepared for some spoilers ahead. So let's start with her introduction in the Battle of Christophsis. She shows up with a single green lightsaber. Now, what's the significance of green? Well, this depends on who you ask. There are both in-universe explanations, things that have to do with written lore in books and comics, and out-of-universe explanations like using green screens versus using blue screens, and of course Samuel L. Jackson just wanting a different color lightsaber. So I'm going to go with the explanation that I like the best. Green is the color used for the Jedi Consular. These are Jedi that were more in tune with the mental aspects of the Force and choosing to reflect on its mysteries. Green is a reflection of harmony, helpfulness, spirituality, and goodwill. Yoda and Qui-Gon were two perfect examples of Jedi Consulars. Now you could still be a great lightsaber duelist as a Consular, but that was not their main focus. Blue lightsabers were given to Jedi Guardians. Guardians were known to be highly skillful in lightsaber combat. Blue represents righteousness and bravery. Obi-Wan, Anakin, and even Count Dooku before he turned to the dark side were all perfect examples of Jedi Guardians. Now according to Dave Filoni, these colors can be changed, and I'm going to get to that in just a minute. So at this point, Ahsoka's lightsaber colors reflect her relationship with the Force. 
Force. She believes heavily in the will of the Force. Both Filoni and George Lucas wanted to also show the subtle contrast between Ahsoka and her master Anakin. Now during a mission to find an arms dealer in the Coruscant underworld, Ahsoka actually has her lightsaber swiped by a pickpocket. So she enlists the help of a Jedi master named Terra Sanube, an expert on the Coruscant crime world. They are able to track down her lightsaber and eventually get it back from a couple of Torellian Jango jumpers. Now it's shortly after this that she gets a bit of an upgrade. She adds a second lightsaber, a shorter yellowish green blade called a Shoto lightsaber. Now generally Shoto lightsabers were used by smaller Jedi like Yoda or Yaddle or even Evan Peel, but there's a reason why Ahsoka added it to her green lightsaber. It shows a progression and a maturity in her character and her fighting style. See under Anakin, she actually studied form 5 lightsaber technique. She was proficient in both variants. There's two variants. One is called Sheen and the other one is called Gem So. Now her reverse grip helped her with Sheen, which was superior for fighting opponents with blasters. But she also used the other variant, Gem So, which was superior for fighting against other lightsaber duelists like Grievous, Ventress, and of course eventually Darth Maul. But now with dual lightsabers, she adopted a fighting style called Jar Kai. Jar Kai was perfect for Sheen users because it allowed the duelist to use the concepts of Sheen and Gem So together. That was why there were instances where Ahsoka used a conventional grip for one of her lightsabers while using the Shoto lightsaber with the reverse grip. But in many cases, Ahsoka wielded both her sabers with a reverse grip. Now, Jar Kai was also used by Darth Sidious, Ahsoka, and Asaz Ventress, and even Anakin used it when he fought Dooku with two lightsabers. Now, this was Ahsoka's fighting style throughout the Clone Wars. It wasn't until she was framed for the bombing of the Jedi Temple when she lost her Shoto saber during the escape when Anakin and the clones were chasing her on Coruscant. Her green bladed saber is taken by Anakin after she's captured by the clones. Now, after she's acquitted during her trial, she's asked to rejoin the Jedi Order. She declines and leaves the Order and of course leaves her lightsabers behind. Now, a few years go by without her lightsabers just beating people up the normal old-fashioned way when fate takes her to a planet called Obadia where she runs into Bo-Katan. Now Bo-Katan convinces Ahsoka to go back to the Jedi for help in taking back Mandalore from Maul. Maul has now control of Mandalore with his crime syndicate. Here she's reunited with Anakin who just happens to hold on to her lightsabers. To me, this is a pretty big deal. The fact that he's held on to Ahsoka's lightsabers after she left the Order shows how much he still cares for her. He's also made a bit of an alteration to her green lightsabers. I took care of them. They're good as new. Maybe a little better. So now her lightsabers are blue, the same color as Anakin's. What this shows, I think, is he was still thinking about her even after he left. He's always on her side. He's always believed in her, no matter what. It also shows her growth as a character and what she's about to go do by hunting down and fighting Maul. The blue color representing a guardian. Someone represents righteousness and bravery. Now, according to Dave Filoni, there are a few ways to actually change the color of a lightsaber. You can either change the frequency of the emitter or change the angle of the crystal. Anakin knew enough about this, so him being, of course, somewhat of a mechanical genius was probably a pretty easy upgrade for him to install. I'm sure. So she leaves Anakin to go chase Maul on Mandalore while Obi-Wan goes after Grievous on Utapau and Anakin goes to see the Chancellor and this lines up with the events of Revenge of the Sith. Here she also has an absolutely epic fight with Maul on Mandalore. I see the Padawan needs one last lesson. <laughs> Now she captures Maul and is on their way back to Coruscant when Order 66 is given by Emperor Palpatine. She escapes with the help of Rex, but she leaves her blue lightsabers behind, only to be found sometime later by her former master, Darth Vader. So once again, she's without a lightsaber. She's hiding on a backwater planet when she's tracked down by an Inquisitor.
unfortunately for her, the Inquisitor's lightsaber has two kyber crystals. So after a very brief but absolutely epic fight, Ahsoka destroys the Inquisitor and takes the red crystals, bled red by the dark user who corrupts the crystal from its original color. Now, back in Legends lore, original red lightsaber crystals were actually synthetic, but I like the new canon lore a little bit better where the Sith and any dark side user like the Inquisitors, they took normal kyber crystals and corrupted them with the dark side to bleed them red. But Ahsoka here does something unique that we haven't seen before, at least not in the canon lore. She takes the corrupted red crystals and she purifies them. She pours the light side into the crystals, turning them white, removing all corruption and dark side influence. Now this is written about in the Ahsoka novel, so unfortunately we don't actually get to see her do this, but we do see these brand new white lightsabers in Rebels and of course again in the Mandalorian and now in the Ahsoka series. The most iconic weapon in Star Wars, the snap hiss of a lightsaber is unmistakable. Each Jedi must make their own. There is no greater challenge or honor. The process of creating a lightsaber begins when a clan of Jedi younglings, led by either a higher ranking Padawan or Jedi Knight, travel together on the starship Crucible to a sacred ice planet called Ilum. Here, they participate in an ancient ritual called the Gathering. Due to the planet's solar cycle, the alignment of the weak star was only every 19 days, so the Gathering was timed for this specific solar event. In order to harvest their kyber crystals, the heart of the lightsaber, these younglings must go down inside the crystal caves and face difficult tests of personal fears and failings. The entrance to the sacred cave is hidden, but with the leadership of the Padawan or Jedi, they would band together using the force to reveal the entrance. Once inside, the testing begins. They must understand the importance and the purpose of both the Jedi and their lightsaber. They must trust themselves and trust each other. Each kyber crystal is meant for one specific Jedi. Only that Jedi can hear its call. Now the only way to find their crystal is by calling on the force to guide them, to listen, and to see. There are even false crystals, ones that appear to the youngling who is overconfident or impatient, selfish or not relying on the force to guide them. Inside the labyrinth of caves, the journey becomes more personalized. This virgence in the force draws upon the individual's darkest fears and their deepest insecurities. Our Wookiee youngling Gunji could hear his crystal calling to him from across a lake filled with broken ice seemingly unreachable. He panicked. He felt it impossible to get it. Only after practicing patience did he see his path. He would have to wait, calm his mind, and once the light faded from the lake, it would freeze over, giving him a solid path to his crystal. Petro, another youngling, faced a different challenge. He ran into the caves, confident, lacking patience. He immediately finds his crystal. He runs back out of the cave to brag to Ahsoka and Yoda that he was the first one to harvest his crystal. As he opens his hand, the crystal melts to water, a fake crystal. One hard lesson for little Petro. He rushes back into the cave, panicked, looking for his real crystal as he begins to run out of time. As he makes his way through the tunnel, he sees fellow youngling Katuni, who has also found her crystal, but she's trapped behind a wall of ice unable to make it out. Petro's in a hurry, so he can't help. As he runs away, he stops. He realizes his actions are selfish and that the Jedi way is to help people, to put the needs of others before themselves. He turns around and together they use the force to break the ice. As he looks down at the broken pieces, his crystal lies there shining brightly and calling to him. His act of selflessness brought the crystal to him. Once the younglings have harvested their crystals, they return to the starship Crucible. Their droid architect and lightsaber designer, Hu Yang, guides them as they build their hilts. Inside Hu Yang's memory banks are every lightsaber ever created, as well as the Jedi that made them. So choosing their hilt is also a very personal process. Would you like a simple grip or a curved grip? One with an inlay of a Cartusian whale or one with Bastillian ore? What will make you strong in battle and humble in retreat? What connects with your force? Gunji 
visualizes, he feels what his lightsaber will look like through the force. He chooses a wooden hilt. Hu Ying tells him that the wood from a brylac tree is as strong as metal. Using the force along with a basic diagram, they construct their lightsabers. But one mistake, let's say inverting the emitter matrix, causing the power grid to backfire, and the only thing you're going to be igniting is yourself. They must quiet their mind and the diagram will become clear. They must also learn to awaken the force in their crystals. They form a bond through the force and the color of their blades is a reflection of the Jedi that the crystal bonds with. Now after the great Jedi purge, the Emperor Palpatine ravaged the planet Ilum mining its kyber crystals for the ultimate weapon, the Death Star. In order for any surviving Jedi to build the lightsaber, they had to search remote planets as there was up to 20 different types of kyber crystals found throughout the galaxy. In Star Wars Rebels and again in The Mandalorian, we see Ahsoka Tano with white lightsabers. But why are they white? Why did she start off with green ones, then later had blue ones, and now they're white? When Ahsoka Tano was promoted from youngling to Padawan, she arrives to meet Anakin Skywalker for the first time with a single green lightsaber. Later, she gets a second yellowish green lightsaber, a much shorter one. This one's called a Shoto lightsaber. Towards the end of the Clone Wars, she leaves the Jedi Order after being falsely accused of bombing the Jedi Temple. She also leaves behind both of her lightsabers in a symbolic gesture of rejecting the Jedi life and finding her own way. She eventually makes her way back to the Jedi while trying to help Bo-Katan and the Mandalorians from Darth Maul and Pre Vizsla's Death Watch. Anakin showing how much he cares about his former Padawan, gives her a gift, a blue lightsaber and a blue Shoto lightsaber. Then Ahsoka, Bo-Katan, Rex, and part of the 501st clone troopers head off to Mandalore. Palpatine sets in motion Order 66. Ahsoka, Rex, and the clone troopers are coming back from their fighting in the Siege of Mandalore when, following their orders, they turn on her. She escapes, saves Rex by removing his inhibitor chip, and then they fake their death in one of the most heartbreaking scenes in all of Star Wars. Ahsoka leaves her blue lightsabers behind, parts ways with Rex and makes her way to the remote outer rim planet of Tabesca, changing her name to Ashla. Now the name Ashla is a word used by the ancient scholars that studied the force on the planet Tython. They referred to the light side of the force as Ashla. She finds work with a wealthy family of smugglers called the Fardi clan. She works for a while there, befriending the family, including a force-sensitive child named Hadala. At the very first Empire Day, the Fardi kids come to her telling her that the Imperials want to meet everyone. With all the Imperials in town, she plans to sneak off the planet by setting her blaster to explode, causing a distraction, then takes one of the Fardi's freighters. When she escapes, an Inquisitor shows up on Tabesca. We later learn that it's the sixth brother looking for four sensitive children. Ahsoka then escapes to an outer rim moon called Raeda, where she poses as a mechanic. She befriends a local farm girl named Caden. Now, at this time, she's still in hiding not using her force powers and still without any lightsabers. At this point, she also has no idea what has happened to Anakin, but she finds herself reminiscing about her former master, about R2-D2 and all of their adventures together. She eventually becomes the village mechanic and also becomes friends with some of the other kids on the farming crew. One day, an Imperial Star Destroyer shows up and she is chased on Raeda by the Empire who discovers her after she uses the Force to rescue one of her friends, a farm girl and some of her friends she had befriended on the new planet. Back on Tabesca, the sixth brother is getting close to the Force-sensitive girl, Hidala, when he is called to go deal with a Jedi presence on Raeda. Ahsoka then flees Raeda, decides to return to Tabesca, unaware of the sixth brother that's been tasked with hunting her down. But when she gets back to Raeda, the little Force-sensitive girl, Hedala, tells Ahsoka about the shadow she felt the presence of recently. Ahsoka decides she's gonna stop hiding. She's gonna stop denying her connection to the Force and to fully embrace helping people. She decides to then travel to Ilum, the planet where she gets her lightsaber crystals when she was a Padawan, only to find that the Empire was mining huge amounts of Kyber for some mysterious reason. They have completely ravaged the planet. Devastated, she returns to Raeda to find the sixth brother waiting for her. He had kidnapped the girl Kaden, the farm girl she had befriended, and used her to lure Ahsoka in. As the sixth brother attacks Ahsoka, she draws on the Force in order to avoid his attacks even without a lightsaber. The sixth brother 
puts his lightsaber out in front of him as the blade emitter begins to rotate around the circular hilt. Ahsoka sees this and immediately notices the weakness in his attack. She reaches out, grabs the hilt, cracking it with the force. This causes the lightsaber to explode in his hands, killing the Inquisitor in the explosion. She picks up the red kyber crystals from the broken pieces of the lightsaber. Kyber crystals are red from a Sith or dark side user bleeding them, pouring all of their pain and their hatred with dark side energy. What Ahsoka does here is she uses the force, the light side, to purify the red crystals. She pours herself, her light, into the crystals, turning them white. This is the only way to get white lightsabers. It's by taking red crystals from a Sith and purifying them. Ahsoka then reconstructs her newly curved handled lightsabers, one single bladed hilt, and another one, the Shoto. The Shoto lightsaber is actually the same type that Grandmaster Yoda uses. Ahsoka uses this as part of her two lightsaber fighting style called Jar Kai, and of course she prefers the reverse grip. Ahsoka is definitely top three in my favorite characters list, and I'll be putting out lots of videos about her as we get closer to her series next year. During the Clone Wars, Ahsoka Tano was framed for the bombing of the Jedi Temple on Coruscant by her friend and fellow Padawan, Barriss Afi. The Jedi Order removed her status as a Padawan and left her to fend for herself against the Galactic Senate and the Adjutant General Wilhuff Tarkin. Luckily for her, Anakin's loyalty helped Ahsoka prove her innocence and was acquitted of all wrongdoing. The Jedi Council admitted to their huge mistake, one of many during the wars, and wished to restore her as Padawan to Anakin. This was actually your great trial. Now we see that. And because of this trial, you have become a greater Jedi than you would have otherwise. Back into the Order. You may come. Ahsoka rejects the Jedi and leaves the Order for good. Let's explore a different timeline, one in which Ahsoka accepts the Jedi apology and rejoins the Order. What would her fate look like? Ahsoka returns to Anakin's side. She's with him when they discover Echo being held by the Techno Union on Skako Minor, and then she arrives on Yelvana to help Obi-Wan and Commander Cody defeat the droid army. From there, they get a distress call that Coruscant is under attack by General Grievous and his droid army. Now, because because of Ahsoka being with Anakin, she's not on Obadiah, so she doesn't get in contact with Bo-Katan. The Siege of Mandalore happens without Ahsoka or Rex and the 332nd Company. Maul is able to retake Mandalore with his Shadow Collective. Back on Coruscant, Ahsoka, Anakin, and Obi-Wan are in their ETA-2 interceptors fighting off vulture droids. Ahsoka breaks off to help Rex and Jesse with some buzz droids who've attacked their fighter. I'm gonna go help them out. No, they are doing their job, then we can do ours. Anakin and Obi-Wan are doing the same when they make their way onto the Separatist command ship where Palpatine is being held hostage. Anakin kills Dooku and rescues Palpatine and an injured Obi-Wan. They make it back to Coruscant where Palpatine continues to separate Anakin from Obi-Wan and Ahsoka. The secrecy of their meetings and the Chancellor's meddling in Jedi affairs raises suspicion in Ahsoka and the Jedi Council. In one of these meetings, Anakin discovers that Palpatine is the Sith Lord they've been looking for. Obi-Wan at this point is sent to Utapau to confront General Grievous. Ahsoka and Anakin are waiting inside the temple for Mace Windu and the three Jedi Masters to arrest Darth Sidious when Anakin tells Ahsoka he can't sit by and wait, that he needs to be there to help, but to help who? After a brief argument, Anakin decides he's going, and Ahsoka, she can stay behind if she wants. Of course, there is no chance Ahsoka's gonna be left behind. She needs to be by Anakin's side. On their way, Ahsoka starts to have a really bad feeling. Right then, a memory flashes in her mind. A memory so vivid and clear that she is shaken to her core. It's a vision, back on Mortis, sitting at the fire when her future self appears. She remembers what was said to her. Be warned. You may never see your future if you remain his student. Leave this planet. She comes back to reality, but not sure what to do or what to think. Everything is happening so fast. As they enter Palpatine's chamber, they see Master Windu standing over the Sith Lord and his lightsaber pointed directly at Palpatine's face. Ahsoka stays back near the entrance while Anakin rushes in to stop Mace from killing his friend. Everything happens in a blur. As Master Windu raises his lightsaber to strike down Palpatine, Anakin ignites his own lightsaber and cuts Master Windu's hand off. Ahsoka yells at Anakin to stop. What have you done? She ignites her lightsaber and charges Palpatine as 
as lightning comes from his fingertips, striking Master Windu, propelling him down to the city below. Ahsoka lunges at the Sith Lord, but his lightning fast reflexes are just too fast. He sends her back with lightning as she slams into the wall and lands on the ground motionless. What have I done? As Ahsoka starts to regain consciousness, her eyes open to a blurry vision of Palpatine standing over a kneeling Anakin. You shall be known as Darth Vader. Immediately, the vision on Mortis flashes again in her mind, and now she understands. Be warned. You may never see your future if you remain his student. As she's fading in and out of consciousness, Palpatine tells Darth Vader, Every single Jedi, including your friend, Obi-Wan Kenobi, is now an enemy of the Republic. As Ahsoka stands, she sees Anakin. No, not Anakin. Something different. Something unrecognizable. She is now his enemy as are all of the Jedi. He ignites his blade as he stands there, her lightsabers on the other side of the room. He thrusts it straight through his friend, killing Ahsoka. Just call me? <laughs> Don't get snippy with me, little one. You never would have made it as Obi-Wan's Padawan, but you might make it as mine. It is the will of the Force that you're at my side. Master. What must be done, Lord Vader? Do not hesitate, show no mercy. This tragedy is what I believe would happen had she not left the Jedi Order. Anakin confirms this in Season 7 of The Clone Wars. All makes sense now. What? If Ahsoka hadn't left the Order, then she wouldn't have been where she needed to be. That's one way to look at it, I suppose. It's the only way to look at it. She was always meant to leave the Jedi Order, and Anakin was always meant to destroy the Jedi, and later bring balance to the Force. Things are the way they were meant to be. Ahsoka's massive influence on the Rebellion and her spy network would have looked completely different, if not non-existent, had Ahsoka been killed during Order 66. This video contains spoilers for various Star Wars comics, books, TV shows, and movies. One of the biggest factors in the eventual takedown of the Empire's most valuable weapon was a spy network called Fulcrum. Ahsoka Tano had escaped the Great Jedi Purge and was in hiding on an outer rim planet called Raeda. The Empire had just started to inhabit these backwater planets, especially ones like Raeda, who were easily exploited for their farmlands and natural resources. Ahsoka only wanted to hide and protect herself from being discovered as the Jedi were still being hunted down and killed. But it didn't take long for her to see what the Empire was doing to to the small moon and its people. She was able to organize the locals into a small insurgency, fighting back against the Empire's tyranny. During one mission, their plan turned into an all-out battle. Ahsoka, who had completely avoided using the Force in public, had to reverse that decision to save some of her friends. Back on Alderaan, Bail Organa got wind of this insurgency on Raeda through a report from a small intelligence network he had just started. But the last sentence in this report stopped him dead in his tracks, confirmed Jedi activity. He sent out two pilots that he knew he could trust. He told them what to look for, what ship was seen, and they set out to track this Jedi down. They found the ship and used their tractor beam to pull it in. As they approach the ship, Ahsoka steps out before the two can even get two words out, she knocks them both unconscious. Not knowing who they were or what they wanted, only that they decided to use a tractor beam before any contact, she rushed to the bridge to disable the beam so she could get away. But on her way, she runs into R2-D2. He tells her about a senator that he was helping and that the two people were just trying to find her not to capture her. She has the little droid release the tractor beam, but also has him send a signal to Bale with the coordinates to her ship. After Ahsoka leaves, the two pilots return to Bale where he sees a recording of the engine room. He catches a glimpse of Montreal sticking up above some cargo. He realizes that it's Ahsoka Tano. He boards the ship and makes his way to the coordinates and finally finds the former Padawan. He tells Ahsoka that he's organizing a rebellion and recruiting people to help in the fight. Ahsoka at this point is still traumatized from the 
Clone Wars, suffering from all that she's seen and done. Her first reaction is to tell him no, that she's seen enough war and killing. But after some non-aggressive negotiations, Ahsoka agrees to help, but only if he will assist her on her mission to save some of her friends on Raeda. Of course, Bail agrees. Ahsoka heads back to Raeda, rescues her friends, and helps fight the Imperials who were on the moon. Bail sent along a few A-Wings for the fight, as well as some transport ships to evacuate as many locals as they could. He was able to smuggle the refugees to Alderaan, where they could start over. Now that Ahsoka is officially part of the rebellion, Bail asks her about her role. Ahsoka decides she wants to take over the intelligence network that he had started, providing Bail an extra layer of protection to make it that much harder for him to be traced to the rebellion. She didn't want to recruit, although if she found people along the way, she could definitely make it work, but she wanted to listen to what the people needed, to see who needs help, and to give missions to agents and cells and help them accomplish it. He asks Ahsoka what she would like to be called so that her identity could be kept a secret. She replies, Fulcrum. Now, Fulcrum was the name of a subspace radio frequency Anakin Skywalker used during the Clone Wars. Ahsoka led the rebel cell known as the Spectres, led by Hera Syndulla. They were part of a larger cell called the Phoenix Squadron who were instrumental in saving Lothal, destroying the TIE Defender factory and sending Grand Admiral Thrawn to unknown space via some helpful Pergil. The Fulcrum agents were to remain anonymous, only using an avatar. The symbol of the Fulcrum agents was the same markings of the face of Ahsoka. The agents were also commanders as they investigated Imperial activity and gave missions to their subordinates. They also directed forces and oversaw associated cells. The use of Fulcrum as a single codename allowed allowed for the confusion of Imperial intelligence operations if an individual was to ever be caught. Now there are only three, as of now before the Andor series, agents that we know of. Ahsoka, Agent Alexander Callus, the former Imperial officer under Thrawn, and Cassian Andor. Cassian, of course, was instrumental in recovering the plans to the Death Star on Scarif, and well, you know the rest. Welcome to my episode one breakdown and review of Tales of the Jedi. Let's break it down first and then I'm going to give my thoughts at the end. Now this is the birth of Ahsoka Tano. Her planet Shili is a very primitive planet as you can tell. And we get our first glimpse at little Ahsoka which of course is absolutely adorable. We find out that on their first birthday the Togutas tradition is to take them out on their first hunt and they learn about the circle of life. Now it's interesting that they have her using a slug thrower instead of a blaster. Now slug thrower are what the Star Wars universe refers to as what we would say traditional guns. Now they don't show this a lot in Star Wars but it seems like more primitive people and planets carry these instead of blasters. Now as she teaches Ahsoka the meaning of life and facing death an Akul watches them from the tall grass. Now these Akuls they're giant saber-toothed cats native to Shili and the teeth of these animals are what you see on the headdresses of the Togrudas. Now they're obviously an apex predator and could destroy an entire village. Their tradition was that these teeth could only be worn by those who had slain in a cool single-handedly. Jedi Master Shock T had actually done this and her headdress actually had the teeth of in a cool. Now the cat overwhelms Pav T and takes Ahsoka back to its den. This is where Ahsoka reveals a pretty unique Jedi power. This power actually has a few names, animal friendship or beast control or animal bond. Now not all Jedi have this power. We saw Edge of Bridger use this with the Pergil to pull Thrawn's ship into unknown space and rebels. We also saw Obi-Wan use this in Revenge of the Sith on Utapau. And then in the Legends timeline, Qui-Gon, Darth Bane, and Jason Solo all use this. Now, as she rides the Akul back into her village to an obviously shocked Togruta community, Gantika reveals that Ahsoka is a Jedi. Now, Jedi in this Togruta world is extremely rare, and most of them have never even seen a Jedi. So from here, they obviously contact the Jedi, and Plo Koon is the one who takes her in. Now, in in the Ahsoka novel, a Zygerian slaver shows up posing as a Jedi to collect her, but Ahsoka is able to escape and find Master Plo. Now we're going to talk more about the Ahsoka novel for my episode 6 review, so make sure you tune in for that because there are some more retcons. So now this episode I thought was absolutely just adorable. It's, it's, it was cute seeing little Ahsoka. Uh, and of all the episodes, I think this one was probably the weakest, but I still really, really liked it. The show is overall so good, so saying that this episode was the weakest is in no way 
saying that it was bad at all. I just think that the stakes are much higher and much more intense in other episodes, which of course I'm going to cover in my other breakdowns. Make sure to hit the subscribe button to see all of those. I'll be releasing them as soon as I finish them, but when episode two is done, it'll be linked right here. So thank you guys so much for watching and may the force be with you. Welcome to my Tales of the Jedi Episode 5 Breakdown and Review. Let's jump right in and I'm going to give you my thoughts at the end. So this episode should actually be named How Ahsoka Got Brain Damage. Because man, did she take a beating in this episode. So we start with Anakin running down the temple corridor to make it to Ahsoka's training session. We have a little Easter egg here with Caleb Doom with his master Depa Balaba. Now you may know Caleb Doom by his other name in Rebels, Kanan Jarrus. Man, this scene is so good. You have Ahsoka doing some amazing fighting with these new training droids. Caleb over there is just in awe. And if you look at all the Jedi Masters, they all are actually really impressed. Even Obi-Wan makes a comment to Anakin about it. But Anakin, he ain't got no time for training droids. Ahsoka sees right away that her master is not impressed. And this is such a huge revelation into why Ahsoka is such a powerful force user. Now, of course, she has a lot of potential, but really it's Anakin's training. It was so much different than the other Jedi. So he gives her a little challenge that she eagerly accepts. She's going to go train with the 501st and he wants her to train with real soldiers, not droids. So droids are predictable, but what he wants is Ahsoka to be able to feel the intentions of which trooper is going to shoot first. Now for the first time, Jesse tags her and she goes out for like an hour and this scene actually got a pretty good chuckle out of me. Sorry, Commander. They do this over and over and over, and you see Ahsoka start to get frustrated. She tells Anakin that the droids aren't even half as good as the soldiers, and that's Anakin's entire point. If she can protect herself from an elite group of clones firing at her, she's going to be able to stand a chance against anything. Now, over and over, she gets hit with these stun blasts. Rex, at one point, gets a bit concerned, and Anakin's like, nah, she'll be fine. Then we finally get to see her get her Shoto lightsaber. Now, so this is taking place around season three of the Clone Wars. We never got a, a reason or or anything a while. All of a sudden she just shows up with two lightsabers. So that was actually pretty cool to see. Now this final test they show is pretty interesting because she's doing a great job. She's defending them off. She's able to keep from getting shot. And then Rex decides to pull out his blasters and just shoots Ahsoka in the back. Now it's interesting because during the Clone Wars Order 66 scene, she had Rex's inhibitor chip taken out and he was lying there on the table when the clones started to break through the door. He sat up and she was about to get overwhelmed and he shoots from behind her in the exact same way, but this time he shot past her and hit the clones. I thought that was a cool little tie-in. Not only that, you can see her use the same like jump spin move during Order 66 that helps her escape the original onslaught when the clones first get Order 66. And we end the episode where we see in the Clone Wars as Rex leads her out to the rest of the 332nd company to make their escape. Absolutely amazing. Seeing why and how Ahsoka was able to survive Order 66 was so awesome to see. Anakin is the one that saves her life. He knew that his training would save her one day, even though he didn't know it was going to be part of it in the worst way. All right, check out my episode six breakdown here when it's available. Thank you guys so much for watching and may the force be with you. Welcome to my Tales of the Jedi Episode 6 Breakdown and Review. Let's jump right into it and I'll give my thoughts at the end. Now the events of this episode are pulled from the Ahsoka novel, but man did they change a lot. We start with a pretty heavy scene, Padme's funeral on Naboo. Ahsoka is there and Bail Organa is standing next to Mon Mothma. And I think this might actually be Rush Clovis, who was a senator from Scipio and he was also in love with Padme during the Clone Wars. Bail sees Ahsoka and follows her out into a corridor. Bail then asks her why she's there. Now the reason why he says it's so risky is because the Emperor was actually watching this funeral really closely. He had spies and clones all over the place just in case any Jedi showed up. Then just as a few clones show up, Bail helps her get out without being noticed and gives her a communication device. And he's talking to the clones but really he's telling Ahsoka that if she ever needs anything that she can reach out. Now this is a lot different from the book. Bail doesn't know that Ahsoka's alive until about a 
year later, which we're going to get to those events later in the episode. Ahsoka then heads to what I assume is probably the planet Raeda. At least that's where she goes in the book. She saves this girl in the village. Then she calls Ahsoka Ashla. Now this is a cool little Easter egg. George Lucas originally wanted the light side of the force to be called Ashla in the original trilogy. And then he wanted the dark side of the force to be called Bogan. But this never actually made the final cut. A Filoni actually brought it into canon officially during Rebels when the Bendu refers to the light side of the force as Ashla. Also in Legends, on the Jedi planet Tython, there's two moons, a light moon called Ashla and then a dark moon called Bogan. Now the boy here in the village is an Imperial supporter and after the Hay incident, he sees that she's a Jedi. Well, the sixth brother magically shows up and of course this boy rats her out. Ahsoka then confronts the Inquisitor and she dispatches him in about two seconds. Now, if you're wondering why it was so quick, well, the Inquisitors weren't very powerful. You know, they trained to hunt Padawans and lower level Jedi. Even the most powerful Inquisitor, the Grand Inquisitor, was killed by Kanan Jarrus, who was essentially a Padawan when his master died. So the sixth brother was one of the weaker Inquisitors. Plus that absolutely terrible design of a lightsaber has a really huge weakness that pretty much any intelligent Jedi could exploit. Then you add on to that, he faced the Padawan of Anakin Skywalker. I mean, she literally just defeated Maul on Mandalore about a year ago. So this guy, he never stood a chance. Now these events differ a lot from the Ahsoka novel. It was actually Caden Lardy that was held hostage by the Inquisitor. He also didn't know who Ahsoka was when they finally fought. Bail Organa had R2-D2 that actually ran into Ahsoka first before they met up later on. Bail then helps the three villagers onto a ship where he takes them back to Alderaan. Now, Ahsoka actually uses these crystals from the Inquisitor's lightsaber to make her white lightsabers. She purifies them through the Force. You can kind of see it as like a reverse bleeding. So this episode was amazing. Even with a lot of the details changed, I still think it was extremely well done. I mean, I think it's pretty impressive what Filoni can do with 10 minute episodes. Now I really hope they make more characters in this format and continue this series because I love what they've done. You know, essentially what they're doing is they're taking two characters, Dooku and Ahsoka, and they're asking them the same question, but getting two different answers. You know, they both leave the Jedi Order, but for completely different reasons. In the last episode of Tales of the Jedi, Ahsoka faced off against probably the coolest Inquisitor we've seen so far, but she absolutely destroys him, and she didn't even need her lightsabers to do it. But something seemed oddly familiar about how she beat him, so I went back and I rewatched the Clone Wars and probably the best fight in the entire series. It's when she fights Maul on Mandalore. They were fighting up in the rafters when Maul knocks Ahsoka's lightsabers out of her hands. If you notice, she uses the exact same method to defeat Maul. She had no lightsabers, and she she went after the one weakness of both Maul's dual bladed lightsaber and the Inquisitor's spinning helicopter lightsaber, the hilt. Now both of these events were about a year apart, but that poor Inquisitor never stood a chance. Now if she could defeat Maul, there is no way that it, this guy had any hope of victory. And I can't believe I didn't catch that right away. Let me know what you guys think in the comments and may the force be with you.